welcome uh, to everyone uh, to this uh, new uh, Fujita Health Alumni Association uh, webinar. Uh, I want to welcome, of course, uh, Professor Yoko Kato, uh, our mentor and master, and uh, Dr. Thomas Tommy, uh, who will be uh, my co-chair today. Uh, thank you also to uh, Raja uh, Krishnankuti, uh, who is always uh, ready to uh, host and organize uh, these webinars. I see also uh, Dr. Liu, uh, who is another uh, main uh, guest uh, of, uh, of uh, these webinars. Uh, and of course, uh, I welcome our two speakers today. Uh, Professor uh, uh, Fuji, Masazumi Fuji, who will be the first speaker, and uh, uh, Dr. Sneha Chitra, uh, she will be our second uh, speaker. Uh, so uh, the first, uh, the, well, first of all, maybe Professor Yoko Kato wants to uh, say something to, to start this webinar. Do you want to introduce uh, the webinar. Uh, because Japan is uh, 7 p.m. now. So uh, good evening. How are you, everybody? I'm very proud uh, to have all of you today's webinar. Uh, just I want to one thing about the Professor Fuji. Fuji became uh, just uh, the new chairman of the Fukushima uh, University. Uh, he, he is from Nagoya. Uh, he graduated from the university. We are very proud of him because uh, he is one of the, the very promising uh, new chairman, I think, in Japan. Uh, he's, uh, of course, uh, someone will introduce him, but his uh, main uh, work is the skull base, but uh, not a usual skull base. Uh, it's very unexpected. So, so what did I say? Maybe Dr. Fuji will tell okay. us soon, I think. And also, he knows many things about uh, uh, white matter. So maybe uh, it's, it's some uh, uh, same, same stream of the, maybe Dr. Suneha will talk about uh, something like uh, white matter. I think uh, uh, the two speakers are very, very uh, good. We uh, very much expecting your lectures. Thank you, Professor Kato. Uh, yes, actually today uh, the topic is uh, uh, the white matter and uh, mm -hmm. fibers, so it will be very interesting. Uh, Professor Mazazumi Fuji, as uh, Professor Yoko Kato said, is Professor and Chairman at the Department of Neurosurgery, Fukushima Medical University in Japan. Uh, his main research and clinical interests are brain tumor, skull base, uh, and also uh, white matter, uh, in particular neural basis of language and other higher brain functions, and image-guided surgery. And today he is going to talk about fiber dissection, a renaissance in contemporary neurosurgery, uh, which is an extremely intriguing topic, I think. <laughs> so, Professor Fuji, please, uh, you can start your talk. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for uh, in inviting me and uh, giving me uh, such an opportunity. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to talk about the fiber dissection study, uh, which is a very old uh, technique, but I think it's uh, now this technique is uh, becoming more and more important for neurosurgery to understand the brain itself. So, uh, I will kind of uh, basic uh, aspect of the fiber dissection and uh, white matter anatomy. I will show you uh, part of it. And of course, as you can see, this is uh, Atlas uh, written by Ludwig and Klingler in the last century. And uh, uh, the, in this Atlas, I'm very, very, Mm, are surprised that this quality of dissection is really nice, really beautiful. Uh, because I personally, of course, uh, do the fiber dissection study, so I can understand uh, how this means. I mean, this is very beautiful and probably 
uh, much, you know, enthusiasms uh, you should uh, have. Otherwise, you cannot, uh, you know, uh, create such such a beautiful um, fiber dissection. Anyway, uh, this photo uh, you can obtain through the internet free. So, if you are interested, uh, please. Uh, get uh, uh, these uh, atlas. Anyway, fiber dissection, uh, I would say now it's a kind of a renaissance uh, because fiber dissection study uh, started very old uh, in 17th century, 17th century, and uh, probably it uh, reaches its uh, a peak uh, probably in the uh, the last century, and then probably after uh, uh, mid 20th century, uh, the human being uh, probably goes, uh, went into the world of micro anatomy, uh, tissue and uh, even molecular things of the brain. But uh, however, now, as you can see, we have now uh, MRIs such as diffusion MRI and tractography and uh, uh, resting state of MRI, you can visualize the uh, cortical, you know, uh, connectivities uh, presented here. And I think uh, that's why we should go back to the anatomy itself again. And uh, I think new tracks are being discovered now and still still discovered and uh, uh, finding details of the tracks. We are now finding details. And also uh, we have now new insights of a brain as multimodal networks. It's not solid and rigid and unchangeable uh, brain. It's changeable, you know, plasticity and, uh, you know, uh, and that all. <laughs> so we, we should think the brain as a network anyway. So if you think this brain is a network, you should know the uh, details, the white matters. And for example, uh, this is uh, our job. Uh, it's very recent work uh, to, uh, you know, a paper in 2021. And we found uh, this superior frontal longitudinal tract in the frontal lobe. This tract uh, is connecting between DLPFC, this is dorsolateral prefrontal cortices, and the premotor uh, areas. Uh, in the previously, uh, they say, they said that there is no such a straight and uh, direct to, uh, pathway in this area, but we explored uh, the fiber dissection study and also, of course, tractography uh, studies. And uh, we found that there is, there exists, uh, you know, a direct pathway from the prefrontal cortices to the very, very anterior part which is DLPFC. And uh, this is apparently independent, uh, our, you know, tract uh, from, from the SLF2. So it's not a part of SLF2, this is independent tract. So this is uh, our, you know, job, recent job. So anyway, uh, I want, what I want to say is uh, fiber dissection study and use with, of course, sophisticated imaging uh, modality is a uh, very uh, kind of cutting edge uh, area in neuroscience and very important in neurosurgery too. And uh, today I want to focus on the sagittal stratum. Uh, this sagittal stratum is a multi-lane highway in the brain. And uh, I think this is this structure, uh, the neurosurgeon must know the details. And here is the sagittal stratum location and uh, kind of 
let's say this is Maltlane Highway, probably involves in many variety of uh, higher cognitive functions. So uh, let's, uh, you know, let me show you a video, which is a fiber dissection itself. Now we are exposing the corpus callosum uh, for the people, uh, you know, uh, who never done that before. So fiber dissection studies like this now, this is the medial aspect. Now this is a single room. We are elevating by the, you know, with spatula, wooden spatula. And then you peel off uh, the white matter bundles of single room. And then uh, this, can you see this? This is a, a commissural fibers of a corpus callosum. Uh, next, uh, we are now peeling off that this is a ventricle, lateral ventricle, a pendulum from medial aspect. So this is a lateral wall of the appendium. And then we see this, can you see? This is tapetum. Tapetum is a commissural fibers of the corpus callosum, a splenium of the corpus callosum. Later, this I will explain again. Anyway, uh, today my uh, focus is sagittal stratum. And the sagittal stratum is uh, located uh, uh, approximately lateral part of the trigon of the lateral ventricle. And uh, this is a photo of a uh, fiber dissection study of the left, called a left hemisphere. And uh, first, uh, long association fibers is acute fasciculus from lateral aspect to medial aspect. You know, we uh, do step by step the fiber dissection from the lateral aspect. And then we encounter first, this is a very superficial uh, kind of association fiber, acute fasciculus and uh, SLF system, superior longitudinal fasciculus system too. And then uh, we elevate this uh, part, uh, acute fasciculus, and then it appears. It means uh, sagittal stratum. Sagittal stratum is the fiber bundles orient oriented uh, from anterior to posterior direction. Uh, very, uh, you know, prominent uh, and very clear, clearly seen uh, structures when you do the fiber dissection studies. And this is a color map of diffusion uh, DTI, diffusion tensor imaging. And then green color shows anterior, anterior posterior direction fibers. And uh, here, this is stars, means the trigon of lateral ventricle. And uh, uh, lateral to the trigon of the lateral ventricle, here dense green uh, bundles you can see. So this is sagittal stratum bundles of the sagittal stratum. So let me uh, show uh, step by step, uh, part by part, the sagittal stratum, the components. Uh, let's say, I think, I would say sagittal stratum has three layers, three layers. And this is the first layer, okay? And it's it's a deepest layer. Deepest means it's uh, most medial, most medial, not lateral. So first, as I told you before, this is a tapetum. Tapetum is a commissural fiber of the splenium of the corpus, corpus callosum. So just uh, lateral to the appendium. Uh, here, this is tapetum. Tapetum is a kind of vertical, vertically oriented, uh, you know, uh, fibers. So it's uh, clearly different from the sagittal stratum. And the first layer uh, consists of, this is optic radiation and thalamic peduncle, posterior thalamic peduncle. So this fiber bundle goes to the thalamus. Okay, so this is uh, optic radiation and the posterior uh, thalamic peduncle. 
Okay, and this is a, a view of optic radiation and the optic system here, this is chiasm. And then optic tract goes to the lateral genicrate body here. And then from the lateral genicrate body, uh, the optic radiation goes to the calcaline sulcus, visual cortex. So this is another angle of the view. Uh, this is optic radiation. And uh, in the first layer, I think it's optic radiation and uh, this is not, not uh, so different. I think it's almost the same layer that runs the anterior commissure. This is a fiber bundles of the anterior commissure. Anterior commissure comes from here, penetrating the uh, basal ganglia, actually the uh, uh, globus pallidus, and then uh, comes to the bilateral uh, temporal occipital cortices. Okay, this is the first layer of the sagittal stratum. Uh, let's move on to the, uh, no, no, this is, uh, okay, AC. AC means anterior commissure here, uh, runs like this. And let's move on to the, the second layer. Second layer is the I4, inferior front occipital fasciculus, which is a green one. And the I4 is considered to be the longest association fiber in human being. So anyway, uh, here, as you can see, the uncinate fasciculus uh, in the anterior, anterior part, anterior to the IFOF. And the IFOF uh, has this, you know, antero, uh, posterior direction in the sagittal stratum. And this is a third layer, most lateral layer of the sagittal stratum uh, has two major bundles, the orange one, this is a middle longitudinal fasciculus, MDLF, and this is ILF, inferior longitudinal fasciculus. This, uh, these two bundles consist of the most lateral part of the sagittal stratum. And uh, uh, more, more lateral to the sagittal stratum runs Accurate fasciculus and, of course, a superior, superior longitudinal fa uh, fascicular system. So, uh, I want to show you a case. Uh, this is the case one, 70, 70 years old and a female. And uh, she presented this with topographical disorientation. And here, as you can see, uh, you know, tumor, malignant, this is a malignant glioma, uh, glioblastoma, uh, located in the approximately uh, trigon of lateral ventricle, but uh, precisely speaking, lateral ventricle located just lateral to the, uh, the lesion. That means this uh, tumor is basically located in the medial aspect of the brain, uh, in the uh, precuneals and the posterior cingulate area. And this tumor is extending into the parahippocampal gyrus and also corpus callosum. So uh, how, to, how to resect uh, this tumor? What is the best uh, up surgical approach to, to, to attack this? So uh, think about the white matter structures because the tumor is located in the medial aspect, uh, precranials and uh, posterior cingulate. And uh, actually lateral ventricles uh, is located lateral to this tumor. That means tapetum in red and optic radiation onto commissure first layer. Uh, here, sagittal stratum, and uh, the second layer, IFOF, goes here, and the ILF, MDLF, might run, run here in the lateral aspect, and of course, SLF in the acute fascicular system located here. So I think it's not, it is not a good idea to, to 
to resect this from the lateral side because you you will sacrifice those very important association and the commission even commercial fibers and the projection fibers you have you you will sacrifice and it will this is the right sided lesion so that's why probably you will end up uh, losing spatial kind of cognition you know uh, hemi spatial neglect probably the patient uh, will have after the surgery so the i think that the most important thing is i think it's a, this tumor you should resect from the medial side because the tumor is located in the medial aspect of the uh, hemisphere so i uh, used interhemispheric uh, parieto occipital interhemispheric approach uh, with centurial cutting and remove all the tumor. So lateral aspect of the trigonal lateral ventricle is a kind of a multi-lane highway of major fiber tracks. So I think it's uh, you you should take care of that. And this is uh, the preop in the upper uh, upper and the lower shows a post op. Uh, the gross total resection was achieved and no worsening on visual field and uh, no hemispatial neglect happening uh, postoperatively. And next case, uh, this is the case two, uh, 30s, uh, female, uh, and this is a right side uh, thalamic tumor, palvinar, and uh, probably, uh, probably involved in the lateral geniculate body because uh, her symptom the presented with left inferior homonymous quadrant anopia she has. That means probably this tumor uh, invaded a little bit into the lateral geniculate body. Anyway, uh, the tumor is uh, located in the thalamus and the posterior part and lateral part. And uh, here, as you can see, this is methionine pet is very high accumulation of the methionine. That means this uh, is kind of active. Glioma is uh, most suspected. And here, this is arterial spin labeling MRI, shows very hot spot here. So that means uh, probably the blood flow of this tumor is very rich. So that means you have to take care about the feeder, feeder system. And uh, hopefully, uh, I think uh, we should, uh, you know, manipulate first in the early stage, the feeders first, uh, not late phase. Yeah, uh, step by step, we will check uh, the major tract. So, and this is a 3D anatomy. This is purple shows a thalamus, right thalamus. This is a posterior view. And here, this is orange shows tumor. And as you can see, this yellow bundle, fiber bundle is optic radiation uh, like this. This is actual view showing uh, fiber bundle of the optic radiation lies very close to the uh, lesion. And the key points, uh, this tumor is, uh, is fed by posterior cerebral arteries in the vascular rich tumor. And uh, of course you, Resec if you resect the tumor, there is a risk of worsening of visual field. That means she already has homonymous quadrant anopia, but uh, maybe uh, in the worst scenario, we end up with visual field hemianopia, uh, which I don't like to have. And here is another fiber bundles. Uh, of course, there is sagittal stratum here and this orange bundle is a part, a part of uh, uh, the auditory uh, radiation too. So uh, in the lateral part, there is a you know, dense fiber bundles, important ones. And uh, yeah, this is optic radiation. Here, this is a pyramidal tract runs just anterior to the tumor. And this is a middle longitudinal fasciculus. Uh, no, no, no. This orange shows uh, ILF, uh, inferior longitudinal fasciculus, and this 
this one middle longitudinal fasciculus. Uh, this is I4, and this is SLF3 acute fasciculus. Uh, this uh, red one shows the commercial fibers of splenuval corpus callosum, corpus callosum, commercial fibers. And this is a uh, very posterior angle, posterior view. And the tumor is here, the orange one. And uh, unfortunately, but there is a very important bundle and the syndrome uh, runs just posterior to the uh, tumor. So the tumor is uh, kind of hidden in the forest of those, you know, important fiber bundles association uh, commercial fiber bundles. So uh, we think, we thought, you know, uh, what is the best approach to this uh, thalamic lesion? Uh, one candidate is lateral approach uh, from this side, lateral approach. I think this is, uh, I think it's a good point is short distance to approach, approach. but as, you, as I told you, uh, injury of the sagittal stratum and uh, also auditory radiation. And uh, I think it's uh, not a good idea to do this. I would say so. And also uh, the feeding out is come from the posterior, uh, you know, uh, posterior choroidal arteries. Uh, it is difficult to grab, obtain those feeding arteries in the early stage from the lateral approach from using, if you use lateral approach. And the next thing is a high parietal low lobule approach. This is a one, I, I think it's a frequently you utilized uh, surgical approach from this side. Uh, please look at the coronal uh, view here, the, you know, from this to this very long distance. And uh, I think it's a bad thing is, you know, this tumor is located in located in the kind of inferior half of the thalamus. That means if you come from the high parietal lobule, then you have to cut very much, you know, pretty, pretty much amount of uh, thalamus. You have to cut the thalamus. Uh, I, I think it's uh, not a good idea, to, good idea to cut the thalamus, you know, uh, a large amount, large volume of the thalamus injury is not acceptable. So next thing is maybe uh, occipital transtentorial approach, OTA, and even OTFA. OTFA is, uh, I think, developed by us, uh, occipital transtentorial falsing approach. Tentorium and the fox cerebri is also cut. And uh, here, yeah, this is uh, uh, ipsilateral. This is the ip ipsilateral occipital transtentory approach. But uh, I think it, it is possible to approach. And uh, I think in uh, using this approach, PCAs uh, can be controlled very in the early stage of the surgery. That's a good point. But in the lateral aspect of the uh, tumor, I think it is too much, you know, a brain retraction necessary, and you might have a larger, you know, uh, injury risk of the occipital lobe, which is hemianopia, and I don't want to injure those uh, important cortices. And uh, let let me talk about a little bit about OTFA. Uh, you can cut the tentorium as well as the false faxus cerebri. Then you can approach from the contralateral side, and then you can touch. You can approach the very lateral aspect of the uh, thalamus. I think it is possible, but in this particular patient, it is uh, not a good idea because you have to manipulate uh, contralateral occipital lobe, which is a healthy visual field cortex. And also she has already has the quadrant hemianopia. And if you reject this, maybe we, we have some risk to develop the hemianopia. That means 
bilateral visual field cut may occur that is called cortical blindness. So I think a contralateral occipital transdentorial falcine approach, I think you can theoretically approach uh, to this tumor, but I think it's too much risk uh, we have. So all those, you know, four approaches is not good. Uh, we concluded uh, the, those four approaches are not good for this patient. And finally, uh, we ended up the cross code supracellular bellar transdentorial approach. Uh, this is uh, probably the best approach uh, for this patient. So this is not the ipsilateral, but the cross code means a contralateral uh, superior surface of the cerebellum, cerebellar hemisphere. And uh, you can see directly the tumor itself, and uh, you don't have to cut any of those fiber bundles, which is the uh, beauty of this approach. And uh, also you can grab, you can obtain, you can control the PCA, branch of the PCA, such as the posterior choroidal arteries in the very early stage of the surgery. So uh, anyway, surgical considerations, try best not to worsen visual field, avoid hemianopia for this patient and avoid hemispatial neglect. That means you don't, uh, you should preserve those, you know, uh, fiber bundles, SLF system, acute fascicular system in the lateral aspect of the uh, cortical hemisphere. And uh, uh, early control feeders, PCAs, uh, you can approach to the PCAs in the early stage. That's the uh, very important surgical considerations. And uh, based on those surgical considerations, cross court SCTT, supracellular, cerebellar transdentorial approach is the best approach we concluded. So let me show you our surgery, surgical video. Actually, we not only the infratentorial cranial tomy, but also we applied a surgical uh, uh, supratentorial uh, occipital cranial tomy. We, we do both because we want to uh, do the monitoring of the visual cortices directly. We put the electrodes on the, you know, uh, on the occipital lobe cortex. And we monitor the visual functions during the operation. Okay, the position is like this, quarter prone position. And after the, but this is a, a supratentorial view. And this is a, yeah, calcium fissure. And we uh, place the two electrodes directly monitor the visual uh, functions, VEP. And here, this is the internal occipital vein, and this is the posterior PCA branches uh, going to the thalamus. And here is the thalamus, and this is the basal vein of Rosenthal. And here, as you can see, this is a navigation system tells you that this is the right place, just underneath this. So we reach the tumor and uh, resect the tumor as much as possible. But uh, we uh, intentionally uh, doesn't resect the tumor in the uh, lateral geniculated body because we don't want to uh, have the hemianopia. Anyway, uh, fortunately, this tumor is not a malignant one. This is a pilocytic astrocytoma. So I think uh, you don't you you shouldn't uh, you know very radical too too much radical. Uh, so uh, we ended up uh, intentional less radical surgery and uh, uh, we we achieved the functional preservation. Visual field uh, is not worsened and uh, we preserve the full cognitive functions in this patient. And the summary, understanding not only several cortices, but also white matter tract is, uh, uh, I think it's very essential to preserve important neural networks. And the fiber dissection study with advanced imaging technology contributes in progress of neuroscience. 
and enhances selection of a better surgical approaches in each patient uh, you experience and provides precious educational opportunity for all medical staffs treating patients in neurosurgery. So I want to say, what I want to say is all neurosurgeons must experience fiber dissection study. And I wrote uh, this uh, textbook. This is uh, how to do the fiber dissection study. Uh, however, unfortunately, this is written in Japanese. So uh, hopefully I have uh, maybe English version in the future. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and the acknowledgement uh, shows our department, you know, staffs and uh, another department of anatomy, Professor Hiroyuki Yaginuma and Mia Koftamura, this is speech therapist, and uh, Satoshi Maisama, this is Nagoya University, neurosurgeons and Kenichiro Iwami, this is a neurosurgeon to IH Medical University. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Fuji, for this very, very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, it is a shame that your book is not translated into English. <laughs> yet, but <laughs> right, hopefully, right. Hopefully, you will translate it. Uh, yeah. Actually, I, I really uh, think you showed us how much important uh, it is to know the anatomy of mm -hmm. the uh, white matter to perform uh, good surgery and to yeah. decrease uh, morbidity. Uh, mm -hmm. for our patients. Right, uh, right. Um, I, I have some questions, but I, mm -hmm. I want uh, uh, all the uh, people attending this uh, webinar to uh, mm -hmm. ask uh, their questions. Uh, if someone has questions, please, uh, this is a yeah, good sure. time. Yeah, sure, I'm happy to, to accept. Yeah, it's questions. a good time for us to, to learn from Professor Fuji, <laughs> who really is an <laughs> expert of this uh, white matter and tracts. Yeah. So any question? Uh, so, uh, you know, what I want to ask you guys, you know, uh, you, you do already, uh, you know, fiber dissection, you familiar with fiber dissection studies? Uh, well, for me, only <laughs> books, uh, actually. <laughs> only books, okay. I don't know the other guys. Mm, I think uh, you must, you must do, I think so. A fiber yeah. dissection by you by yourself. I mean, I think it's really wonderful and very in, you know interesting, and uh, I like it very much. Yeah, actually, uh, I, I believe, of course, it's uh, mandatory nowadays for a neurosurgeon uh, to know the anatomy uh, of these mm -hmm. uh, uh, fiber tracts uh, and so on. And my, right. my question is this. Um, how do you, of, of course, uh, you use this information, this anatomical knowledge to plan surgery, okay, mm -hmm. in advance. Yes, yes. But how, uh, how can you maximize the use of this knowledge uh, in the OR, during the OR? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, do you base only on your expertise and your anatomical knowledge? Because when you are operating, you, like, you feel you are in that place and there are mm -hmm. some bundles uh, close by, or of course you use navigation, but mm -hmm. uh, can the navigation system be reliable for these uh, fascicles uh, enough? Uh, how many of these fascicles uh, uh, can be monitored uh, with mm -hmm. uh, intraoperative monitoring and how oh, much yeah. you have to rely to only experience? This is my question. Oh, that's very, very important question. Maybe let me talk about that. Of course, uh, best monitoring is awake surgery. Uh, before that, I think it's you should know all the, those fiber bundles and anatomies. And we also have uh, actually the navigation system with intraoperative MRI. We have uh, three Tesla MRI and you can do the DTIs uh, during operation two, but uh, what I want to emphasize is not uh, the MRI. You know, you don't need the intraoperative MRI. I think so. I would say I would say so. Uh, it is better, but uh, it's not a must. I think surgical uh, anatomical knowledge. If you have a, a solid anatomical knowledge, 
that's enough. And you can feel, and you can, you know, uh, electric stimulation, you can find the functions. So I think it's uh, not every case you, you, sh you shouldn't, you cannot do the awake surgery, but in the selective patient, please use awake surgery for monitoring of, the, of those fiber bundles. So you, you promote awake surgery, not only for uh, language monitoring, but also for other functions monitoring. Sure, sure. That's very important. I think so. Yeah, yeah. For um, glioma the, surgery, uh, yes. Yeah. There is a Dr. question. Okay. A, yeah, may I? Yes, Neha. Yes, please. please. Yeah. Professor, uh, Professor Fuji, thank you so much. It was an amazing uh, lecture, considering I'm also uh, talking about fiber tractography. My question is, do you uh, integrate your tractography with the navigation uh, mm -hmm. tools? And mm -hmm. uh, how often do you find that once you open up the shift uh, that happens intraoperatively, does mm -hmm. that really affect the, how much is your margin of error? Like, uh, you know, is there a calculated value? Or would you still rely on the uh, real-time uh, navigation tractography guidance? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's a similar, you know, uh, topics and uh, yes, uh, uh, of course, uh, you know, we, our system is a brain lab system and they have a DTI, you know, uh, functions. So in each and every case, I, uh, you know, I did a tractography in the patient and it is, of course, the data set is going into the navigation itself. So you can see, kind of see the uh, tract, tract, many tracts during surgery. But of course, as you told, I told uh, uh, as you told, uh, the brain shift occurs during the surgery in, in, in each every patient. I think it's not, uh, you, you cannot ignore the shift. So you cannot 100% sure that, you know, uh, rely on the navigation system. So you have to be very cautious. And uh, in that sense, Maybe intraoperative MRI, uh, high, high field magnet. You can do the uh, tractography mm -hmm. uh, during surgery too. So maybe you can do, but uh, we don't, uh, I think we don't uh, need uh, many times, you know, mostly you don't need such kind of functions. I think it's those uh, functions, uh, three tests MRI is good for research purpose. You know, you have to prove. I, I, I use electrical stimulation during operation, and what fiber bundles running just on the at the point of the electrical stimulation? We have to prove it. Mm. If you want to write the paper, mm. you have to prove it. Then intraoperative MRI is a very strong tool. You know, you can directly it shows the fiber bundles during operation uh, what what you are now stimulating is you know slf acute fasciculus you can prove it but in the most cases clinically speak, speaking i think it's not necessary you know you know where you are i think it, i think uh, anatomical knowledge is uh, i think it's enough indeed uh I also would further that question. Uh, do you use a subcortical stimulation at every mm -hmm. point of the tumor resection? Yes. And also the suction with a uh, subcortical stimulation device, the suctioning. Uh, no, also. No. no, I don't, I don't, I, I personally don't use a suction stimulation, okay. uh, you know. Uh, direct, uh, direct, direct, yeah, direct, uh, you know, uh, yeah, yes, that's right. Okay, okay. So I think we, we can have uh, some questions. There, is, there are questions from uh, the chat. Yes. So I would like to uh, uh, read it. So from Doris George, an anatomist, uh, have two questions. One mm -hmm. is, what are the prerequisites you have done to perform the fiber dissection? So it's about the preservation method of the specimens. He, say, uh, he or she has said the uh, Klingler's method. And also second questions, are these types of fiber fascicles feasible in the operating room uh, during surgery? 
So fiber dissection studies, I use uh, based on, I, I do based on the Klingler method, uh, one week or two weeks uh, frozen, freeze, freeze in the brain, kept in the freezer, minus 20 degree for two weeks. And then uh, maybe twice, not once. I think twice is, I think it's the best, uh, uh, best, uh, you know, specimen. I think so. And the second questions, uh, we, uh, of course, we cannot see in the living brain, the fiber bundles, uh, fiber bundles, you cannot uh, see, uh, just you can feel it because you know the uh, anatomy, <laughs> just feel it. But you cannot see, visualize actually in the during surgery. Yeah, and that's actually the, the most difficult part, right? Uh, that's why I was asking you initially how to uh, move uh, this knowledge uh, from the uh, bench, let's say, uh, to, the, to the operating room. Because, uh, uh, of course, uh, you said you need to feel, you need experience. But when you, when you perform an uh, uh, anatomical lab, cadaver lab, Mm -hmm. Usually you have normal brains, right? Without without humor, right? Right, right. Uh, but without humor, okay. Um, dissecting many brains, uh, many hemispheres, uh, you can figure out where the, right, the fascicles right. are. The problem That's... is when the fascicles are, you know, uh, getting confused by by the presence of a mass. Right, uh, right. That's a, the, the most. Uh, difficult part right 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 but nowadays we can do the dti's so uh we know already you know preoperative before operation we thoroughly you know investigate the location of the fiber bundles you know where where are they so i think it's a uh, pretty you know enough and uh, finally we should stimulate you know uh, during operation uh, awake yeah. surgery, I mean, you can anyway check the functions. Right. So you usually have a, a like neuropsychologists uh, also mm -hmm. in your operating mm -hmm. room to check. Right, right. For, for awake surgery, yes, yes. Right. Because uh, I think it's necessary to have a very mm -hmm. good and strong uh, team. Right. right, 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 right. We have a good speech therapist uh, who is very, very interesting in this field. And also, you have to know that our new neural basis of language and neural basis of other functions, although uh, those are not fully understood, fully understood. But uh, anyway, you should try to 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 get the best knowledge of neural basis, you know, neuropsychological, you know, uh, informations. Right. I that helps that. a lot. As, as you showed uh, also uh, some studies by uh, Hugh Dufo uh, during mm -hmm. your talk, mm -hmm. I want to ask what you think about uh, awake surgery for monitoring um, like cognitive functions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the right hemisphere, because right uh, hemisphere, yes. is, is doing this now. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's a very uh, strange uh, field, I would say, because uh, of course it's an open field, right? Uh, right. Very difficult to um, to assess these kind of functions in the right, patient. Right. So I, I would like to know if you have experience on this specific uh, mm -hmm. monitoring and what's your opinion about that? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I am struggling with uh, right hemisphere too. But I think I feel that this field is very important because right hemisphere is, uh, I would say, uh, maybe superior to the left hemisphere for, for humankind. I think so. Uh, I would say it. so. Its dominant hemisphere is usually the left side. The language is considered to be the, um, right. you know, important. But I would say maybe right hemisphere is more important than left hemisphere. To lose the la language is uh, not too big. <laughs> Personality, you know, 
yeah. uh, read the atmosphere. I, I mean, this is a maybe Japanese expression. Read the atmosphere means uh, uh, this is not not uh, you know uh, language communication, but you can understand you know uh, just seeing what is going on. You know, understand. So right hemisphere is very important, and uh, this is a frontier of neurosurgery, how to preserve those functions. And I think it's not easy. But uh, for example, uh, spatial cognitions, uh, hemi hemispatial neglect, you can avoid this, this uh, you know, uh, awake surgery to monitor the attention and, you know, uh, by line bisection tasks or other tasks, uh, you can monitor and uh, we, what we are now doing is a higher motor functions. You know, uh, the patient uh, has uh, no paresis, no apparent paresis, but you, the patient, some patients cannot uh, do the occupation, you know, uh, previous occupation, they don't go back. So why? Because, uh, their motor activity, motor functions, sophisticated motor functions they lose after operation, uh, maybe in a parietal lobe. So those, I'm doing such kind of, you know, uh, sophisticated higher motor functions such as uh, like a pianist, okay? Uh, yeah. Try to preserve those functions. Very. And I think it's very, very interesting. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Professor. Is there any other question from the audience? Um, Alberto, because of time, probably we should uh, continue yeah. with the second speaker. Yes, um, so please uh, go ahead, uh, Thomas. Okay, th thank you, Professor. Um, we will continue with the second speaker. So my name is Thomas from Indonesia. So I will moderate the second uh, session. So Dr. Sneha Chitra from India. Apollo uh, Specialty Hospitals. Um, Dr. Sneha is a consultant neurosurgeon and also some publications in an international journal. And Dr. Sneha will uh, speak about tractography and the DTI. Uh, please, Dr. Sneha, the screen is yours. A very good afternoon from India. So thank you for the uh, kind opportunity and the introduction. So my topic today is on uh, how do we actually demystify the white matter injuries with DPI and tractography? We just heard a brilliant lecture from Professor Fuji on the surgical aspects of white matter. Now let's just shift from the OR to what happens after the patient gets operated upon. Now, as he very rightly said, the crux of uh, uh, you know, the present era research is on the white matter. The gray matter is the master and the white matter, the monkey is an old concept. Now the monkey is becoming more important than the master. The white matter is the brain's flexible but underrated superhighway, and everybody is on this highway right now in terms of the neuro research. So it consists of both myelinated and unmyelinated axons. It's, it's actually the neural connectome connecting the various areas, one hemisphere with the other, interhemispheric, and conveying information with both the afferent and the efferent axons. So any disruption of any sort is going to cause a motor dysfunction, sensory dysfunction, behavioral changes, and cognitive impairment. Now, white matter injury can occur in stroke, demyelination, hypoxic ischemia, psychiatric disorders, dementia. But as a neurosurgeon, what concerns us most is this subset of patients with a traumatic brain injury, especially diffuse axonal injury, and brain hemorrhage of any sort, an aneurysmal hemorrhage, or a loba hemorrhage, a bleed from an AVM. So we are now dealing with this subset of patients who can manifest with white matter injury later on. So we all know that the cognitive dysfunction is the most common morbidity after aneurysmal SAH. The same holds good for any sort of a traumatic brain injury. Now it could range from a very mild memory loss to behavioral change to amnestic state sleep issues. Now, all these are the complaints the patients come to us in the follow-up OPDs. Now, we have the other subset who unfortunately are minimally conscious or in a vegetative state. And this could be transient or permanent. Now, this early brain injury after a brain hemorrhage, aneurysmal hemorrhage or a contusion, 
can occur both in the white matter and gray matter. Now, the focus here today is white matter. The injury could be focal or global. And how does that injury occur? It starts with your barrier disruption, leading on to it, it's a complex cascade and neuroinflammation, ischemia, and oxidative stress all couple up and end up in white matter damage. Now, this direct mechanical injury of fibers is very important as a surgeon. You know, we are traversing this white matter tract, however hard that we might try to avoid with the various uh, modalities available now, there does occur some sort of a white matter injury during the surgery. Or it occurs at the time of the primary hemorrhage in terms of an aneurysmal hemorrhage or a, a contusion. Now, this undetected white matter injury could be the reason for cognitive decline in these patients. We now know it's, it's the white matter that's the reason for all your cognition change and not your gray matter. This, these connecting fibers are more important. So this is a flow chart to summarize what all the things that could cause your white matter injury. So as a surgeon, inflammation, this biosis, this scarring is what happens following a tumor resection or an aneurysmal clipping or brain surgery of any sorts. That also is going to cause some sort of a white matter damage. Now, other things are the neurologist's purview, the inflammation, the toxicity, uh, the hypoxic injury, demyelination. So it's a cascade, one leading to another. And at the end of it, we have a white matter injury and a lesion. So we are now uh, having the best of imaging technology with the seven Tesla also being put into research use. This diffusion imaging, which came up and rose to popularity in the 1990s, has now been extrapolated to fiber tracking. Now, the, just the basics, uh, it's based on Brownian motion. And the anisotropic diffusion is what helps us to really portray these fiber tracks. Now, we'll have to measure the FA values over the calculated region of interest to pick up some difference. And that is going to evidence your damage to the white matter. This is the XYZ eigenvectors. And based on this, we derive the ellipsoid maps and then color code. And the fibers are you know, seen as beautiful as these images. Now, these are research images from a 7 Tesla MRI. Now, this is a 3 Tesla MRI showing the entire fiber tract in the human brain. The color coding is X, Y, and Z. The X axis is red. You can see the corpus callosum here. The Y axis, the green fibers, anteroposterior. In this case, it's the arcuate fasciculus. And the blue is the vertical, uh, the corticospinal tract here. Now, once you do this, you get a beautiful map, a road map, a pathway to the brain and the white matter. Now, we just saw how beautifully this DPA can be used as a pre-surgical evaluation tool. Dr. Fuji just demonstrated us with beautiful cases, brain tumors, epilepsy surgery, AVMs. Now, any surgery could benefit with DPI because it's going to tell us a radiological, uh, give us a radiological picture of what we are going to encounter in the field. So we have track displacement, we can have the tracks just shifted or the tracks per se infiltrated in case of a high-grade glioma. Now, having said this, how would the DPI as a diagnostic tool in patients who are comatose or unconscious or having a cognitive decline? So that was the question uh, presented to uh, me uh, by Professor Kato during my fellowship period. And it was her brainchild and you know I had the opportunity to work on this particular question. Now, before we answer that question, we need to know about the neural circuits that are responsible for coma, consciousness, and memory. Now, after uh, going through a lot of papers, I kind of simplified it into these two systems, the awareness system and the arousal system. Now, this arousal system is the basis, the brainstem, thalamus, and the ascending reticular activating system. Now, this awareness is what is going to contribute for your higher function the memory, the cognition, and the behavioral changes. Now, here is where the frontal lobe plays a very important role. We have the basal forebrain connecting fibers, dorsal and ventral tracts, and the middle forebrain bundle. Now, it is this portion that is gaining significance in the recent uh, times. A lot of research is on the frontal circuits, which are in turn linked to your ARAS and then to the thalamus and to the brainstem. Now, in the limbic system, it's not just the papus circuit. We have the mammalothalamic tract gaining importance in all the recent research studies. 
And this is again taken from a seven Tesla uh, representation of cartography of the Pappus acute. And this is the Kingler dissection, uh, which Professor was just mentioning of the fiber. You can see how beautifully we can actually portray it in the tractography map. And this is another representation of the system, the frontal circuits I was just talking about, the basal forebrain bundle and the middle forebrain bundle. So this is going to connect all your frontal uh, functions to the core of the reticular activating system and thalamus. So any lesion anywhere, it could be here, here, or here, is going to result in a patient having a dysfunction according to the severity of the lesion. So what did we do? We did fiber tracking for patients with uh, aneurysmal SAH and a couple of other patients I'll be showing who really didn't return back to baseline, who remained obtended with significant cognitive dysfunction. Now this, as you can see, is a classic aqua aneurysm. We presented in a poor grade, clipping was done, and subsequently had a stormy post-op period, decompression, shunting. Now at the end of everything, the patient is just, you know, M5, and he's not awake or conscious. So what happened to his white matter? So let's do the DPI. And what we saw was gross thinning of fiber. This is the shunt artifact here. On the other side, what we really found was this cingulum and the fornix were totally disrupted. There was significant damage we could demonstrate by even thinning of fibers and also with the loss of the FA values in that region of interest. Now, this is another very common case we all encounter, a bifrontal contusion, a, a, an alcoholic with a fall or a traumatic brain injury. So these patients, take quite a lot of time to come back to baseline, even then they're going to have frontal dysfunction. So why is that? So you can clearly see how badly the white matter in the basal forebrain region is affected by this hemorrhage. Now in this case, it's the direct mechanical disruption of the fibers. We can notice the thinning of the right cingulum here. And here very clearly there's discontinuity of the fibers. Another image to show how your hemorrhage can totally distort your white matter and lead to the cognitive decline in these patients. This is another case where the patient remained uh, quite uh, in a minimally conscious state following an MC aneurysm clipping. So again, what did our DTI show? Clearly, this whole portion of the frontal white matter tract is not there. It's, it's totally destroyed by your hemorrhage. Here you can clearly see the circuits are disrupted, disconnected. So this was a patient who underwent uh, calling for a basilar talk. And he did have some kind of a, a mental change, confusion, memory change. Uh, he was on the milder spectrum. Now what we saw, this fellow also had an EVD inserted. There was some frontal white matter hemorrhage here, also on the other side. And we could demonstrate at that particular region, there was thinning of the frontal connective fibers. Now, this is a case where in schizophrenia also, in most of the psychiatric disorders, we have, this is the region of interest. When we do the fractional anisotropy here, we found a significant decline in the value compared with a normal person. Now here, in this subset of patients, there's no direct damage to the fibers. It is, you know, a dysfunction, the internal circuitry shrinks and the FA value decreases. It's more of a thinning. It's more of a, you know, a pathological inflammatory and a demyelinating process here. In contrast with the surgical damage or the hemorrhage induced damage that we saw, where there was clear disconnection of the fibers. This is again an NPH to show how global and bilateral diffuse white matter changes can be demonstrated on a diffusion tensor mapping as decrease in FA values. Here, we do not uh, see much of the loss of fibers. It's more of the fractional anisotropy value indicating that there is dysfunction of the white matter bilaterally. So to summarize, whenever there's a white matter damage to phonics, cingulum, commissural fibers, or papus circuit, the patient comes to you with memory disturbances. When the mammalothalamic tract is involved, it's the amnestic syndrome, loss of reason, memory alone. The frontal connecting fibers, as I told you, are very important because that's when the patient is going to have behavioral changes and cognitive dysfunction and not going back to baseline, not going back to their jobs. They are going to have some sort of a significant cognitive dysfunction for a long time. 
And then we have this subset who are really, you know, uh, the morbidity is so high. Now, these are the patients who are bed bound. And here, the damage is in the core of the ascending reticular activating system. Now, uh, what are the limitations? Of course, it's a very beautiful research tool, but it's operator dependent. You need a, a very enthusiastic and a dedicated radiologist who can sit with you and uh, give you the FA values over the region of interest that you choose. If you want to look at the frontal forebrain, you have to very systematically look at uh, the tractography and the anisotropy value there. And a three Tesla MRI is the minimum uh, uh, requirement. A 1.5 Tesla does not do justice. It, it misses the subtle changes in the FA values. So this is a very interesting and promising research option because we can recognize white matter injury at the earliest by doing a fiber tractography. Now you can do that uh, post-operatively and follow up after three months or six months. And there are papers who are like where they have demonstrated plasticity. Some sort of recovery does happen in stroke patients and also in trauma patients. That's why we see them slowly improving over a period of six months or a year or even after that. Every time they come to you in the follow-up OPD, you are seeing them uh, improve by a shade. So that demonstrates the brain plasticity. And fiber tractography is going to give you evidence on paper that yes, something is happening to the fibers there. They are recovering, the FA values will go up. So we can quantify either residual or permanent cognitive dysfunction. It's gonna help us to talk to the family and really tell them how long are we looking at. And accordingly, the pharmacologic treatment can be tailored and this can open up a very uh, promising concept of uh, tailored neuro rehabilitation. So what's the future? There are a lot of research papers which are targeting white matter injury at the molecular level. So we're going to have a whole new therapeutics of uh, targeting uh, the white matter injury at the gene level. We may have new molecules and new medicines. Now with 7 Tesla, even the smallest of fibers can be mapped. And we can even further uh, detect uh, the smaller white matter injuries. Now this was the paper which uh, got published. And I'm thankful to the entire faculty at Fujita uh, University Hospital. Nagoya and also the radiology department. And uh, last but not the least, Professor Kato for being the inspiration and uh, a source of constant support and stimulation to think on these lines and come up with a topic and a paper. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sneha. Uh, as uh, neuro, uh, neurosurgeons with uh, less than 10 years of uh, experience, I found that uh, white matter dissection and tractography is the most difficult topic for me, I think. So, okay, we open the session for questions and discussions. Uh, any other questions from the floor or panelists? Maybe I think Fuji says there any suggestion to her, please. Yeah, I think uh, this is very, very interesting studies you, you, you've been done. And uh, I think it's uh, mm, very important and uh, I'm very, very uh, interesting uh, from, from the point of uh, the consciousness. You are focusing on the consciousness level and uh, white matter, you know, um, uh, signals, you know, DTI, uh you know factors you know um i think this is really important to point point and uh, of course we have many limitations you know mri dti is not perfect you know uh they cannot to uh show the you know uh and the kissing fibers or you know curved fibers they they cannot you know, assess, you know, there are many limitations, but still I think it's a uh, consciousness and, uh, you know, fibers and white matter status. I think it's a good point and uh, please do more. <laughs> I think so. Thank Must you. I, can I ask uh, Dr. Fuji? Mm -hmm. Okay. As I said, uh, can we uh, evaluate the fiber, the, not only the numbers, but also the thickness? 
Mm -hmm. Can we? So that's if, yes, yes, yes. Uh, she 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 told us the FA value, fractional anisotropy. That's a kind of uh, quality of the fiber bundles. So I think it's uh, you can assess not 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 only the fiber bundle numbers, but also the FAs. I think it's a uh, quite uh, good. Uh, index. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Sneha. Yeah, please. Uh, I, yeah, Sneha, as you, you, well, congratulations, of course, for the very interesting uh, presentation. Um, you, you mentioned about the potentials, uh, uh, prognostic potentials uh, uh, of this kind of exam. So based on these, on the limitations of DTI that we mentioned, uh, is there any um, work uh, in the literature uh, that already assessed uh, the potential of uh, prognostic uh, yeah. value of this uh, kind of study, uh, not only for people who are comatose, but also for other kinds of disease? Yes, uh, now this specific question, uh, there are several papers by neurologists where they have documented the fiber tractography, recovery of uh, the stroke circuit in the follow-up. A patient with hemiplegia uh, recovering to hemiparesis and becoming better over a period of six months to one year demonstrated increase in FA values at the region of interest, the corticospinal tract. So they showed increase in FA values and also the number of tracts. So that is why this whole uh, therapeutic plasticity research is gaining so much uh, you know, uh, focus these days. So there is scope for plasticity even in the adult brain. So that's, that's a very, very promising and exciting feature. Yeah, yeah, and, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, but this uh, is for, this is for a specific uh, uh, neurological yes, deficit, yes, right? Yes, yes. Not for it's conscious. Done only for the corticospinal tract, but they yeah. did. Yeah, there are studies in trauma where they have documented, as I said, the ascending reticular activating system, the thalamic circuit. Even then, when a diffuse injury patient who was uh, almost minimally conscious recovers to a GCS of say ten or eleven over one year. Uh, there was definitely increase in FA values, although they did not demonstrate gross increase in the number of tracks, there was definitely increase in the FA value, meaning there is some structural reorganization that takes place. So this patient is waking up after six months or one year, so definitely the white matter is getting reorganized. So yeah. you, may not, you may not expect uh, uh, you know, continuity or new fibers which are growing, but what we see is... Uh, a very uh, broad plasticity happening at the uh, longitudinal level. So several other fibers will take up, merge, and they're going to contribute to the functional improvement. Yeah, that's very, very promising, very interesting. I, I also read some papers about uh, these DTI studies uh, performed on uh, uh, hydrocephalic patients who underwent uh, VP shunt. And actually, uh, these research groups showed that uh, after VP shunt, uh, DTI showed uh, uh, much more evident, uh, you know, uh, fascicles. Uh, and this is uh, correlated with the clinical benefit uh, these patients had. Uh, I'm particularly interested because uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, we did a DTI study for uh, um, commissural uh, fibers. I mean, not only uh, corp corpus callosum uh, fibers, but also anterior commissure, posterior commissure. Uh, we had a mm, problem uh, by the fact that these bundles are very tiny, very small. Uh, so also uh, what you mentioned in your conclusions on the perspectives about uh, seven Tesla uh, studies uh, uh, is very intriguing. So I will be very curious to see if this uh, higher field uh, um, MRIs uh, can actually help in better defining small fiber tracts. That would be uh, an adjunct, very important adjunct. Absolutely. I think especially the talon mammillary the tract is very, very tiny. So it's quite difficult to delineate, I think. 
the receiver gesture is much better, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, good. Thank you very much uh, to both our speakers, uh, Professor Fuji and, uh, and Dr. Sneha Chitra, uh, for uh, giving us so many uh, information uh, and very useful information about uh, the white matter tracts uh, and bundles. Uh, we know uh, that this kind of knowledge uh, is mandatory nowadays for neurosurgeons uh, to minimize uh, risks for our patients to better plan surgery. So thank you very much for uh, uh, your presentations, your lectures. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Thomas Tommy. Uh, for, thank you, Alberto, for the time. For co-chairing. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yu and Dr. Raja, who uh, had to leave the meeting. Uh, to help uh, every time with organization. And thank you, Professor Yoko Kato. Uh, if you want to uh, spend a few uh, conclusive words uh, uh, about this uh, webinar. Thank you very much for all the time. So just I want to congratulate uh, Dr. Sneha. I, I think uh, I'm very proud of you because you're one of the, uh, the best female neurosurgeon from India. So I think uh, you should extend the, your colleagues in India more and more, I think, in the future. And also, we are very lucky to have uh, the Professor Fuji, uh, the wonderful lecture tonight, I think. So he is a really good neurosurgeon, not only in Japan, but also in the world, I think. Uh, Thank you very much. <laughs> and Fuji says, uh, we wish you uh, a very successful career in the future. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, have a good uh, end of the day because in Japan is uh, already evening. Uh, yeah. And see you uh, next month. Uh, our our uh, past president is uh, video on. Dr. Oh, Itichai. where? Yes, please. Dr. Itichai. Oh, yes. Uh, Itichai. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> good, good evening, <laughs> Professor. <laughs> For Thank you. Alberto. Yeah, hi, hi. I, yeah, I just uh, a bit uh, uh, like a, a much of work, so I am so sorry to attend all times, but I still listen, uh, listening uh, about the contents of the uh, both of two speakers is very good for for idea uh, about how to approach about the bandition to avoid about the complication for the uh mother fiber or another fiber uh thank you very much professor thank you Chai. thank Hi. you Iti. Thank, you, thank, thank you thank you thank you very much thank you professor oh. hi this is arigato look at you thank you very much you are very silent tonight <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> must be tired i think okay okay, so, okay. thank you very much next and... time See you next time, next month. Bye. Bye. Bye.